<clears throat> we talked about substitutionary atonement last week on our part of it and why it was necessary. The verses for this week and last week are Romans 3, 23 through 26. Probably, like I said last week, doesn't necessarily jump out as being an Easter set of scriptures, but it has an awful lot to do with what happens in Easter. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Easter happened because we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in His divine forbearance He had passed over the former sins. It was to show His righteousness at the present time so that He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Great promises that follow a condemnation. We have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but God took it upon Himself to pay the price we owed. It's one of the things that sometimes, we even talked about this in Sunday school class this morning, but one of the things we sometimes struggle with today is we, we do a lot of helping people understand that God loves them. But we have to understand we serve a holy God who was not going to let our sin go unpunished. And we will either bear the brunt of that punishment or Christ has done it for us. And on the day of judgment, when we stand before the Lord, I will be eternally grateful that He paid my price and that I do not any longer owe a debt. So why was atonement necessary? Well, our sin separated us from the love of God and subjected us to the wrath of God. We talked about this last week. Our sin separated us from God. Even though God loved us, our sin separated us from Him. There had to be some way to remedy our plight. And God knew we could not do it ourselves. So God sent His Son, Jesus, to do just that. To be able to pay the price owed for our sin. To receive the punishment and condemnation that our sin deserved. The other thing that I got to be a part of this weekend, I said there was two, was on Friday they did a reenactment here in town. Maybe some of you got to witness that as well, where they crucified Jesus in the, by the fountain down here. But there's a part in it where at the beginning there, the crowd is milling around, some of the actors are walking around saying, he's not who he says he is, he's a liar, he's not the Lord, he's not a king. And you're standing there and you want to argue with them, but you know it's a play at that point or reenactment, so you don't. But then there's an indictment that comes with that. He stood there in a crowd of people to crucify the Lord and said nothing on his behalf. Too often, we're faced with the same thing. People are talking bad about our Savior, about our, what we believe, about why we believe it, and, and we say nothing. That is the sin that separates us from God. Thank the Lord that He sent His Son to pay something I could not pay. He has more, he has accomplished more than I could ever have dreamed to do on my own, or you could have ever dreamed to do on your own. <clears throat> Hebrews 9.22 tells us, Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. So 
like Christ tells us, right? He says, I did not come to abolish the law, I came to fulfill it. And the way you fulfill it is to fulfill all the requirements of the law. Not only his life and the way he lived it, the sinlessness of his life, but his willingness to be the lamb, to be the sacrifice for his blood to purify us. Something had to free us, reconcile us, restore us, and redeem us. We were not capable of doing that on our own. We already read that all fell short of the glory of God. We had all sinned. So how did Jesus pay this atonement for us? Well, He began by living a life that we could not. Christ did more than just die for us. He also became our righteousness before God. Unless He had done this for us, we would have no record of obedience by which we merit God's favor or merit eternal life in Him. Now, I've seen the old uh, analogies, maybe you have too, at some Sunday school class somewhere where they take a bruised banana and they show it and this is us with our sin and then they put it in a brown paper bag and now you can no longer see those things and the brown paper bag was to symbolize Christ. There's only one problem that I really have with that analogy. It's, it's not that those sins are no longer seen or felt or, or witnessed or judged or anything else. It's that the price has been paid. It's that those sins, God looks down on our lives and sees exactly why I should be punished. He sees exactly how short I come in measuring up to the holiness that He has. And then He sees that the price has been paid. Christ lived a life that we could not. He endured the suffering that we deserve. We may not properly appreciate the crucifixion, but many readers of the gospel in the ancient world would have witnessed these crucifixions even before Christ and would have understood exactly how grotesque and horrible they were. By most theologians, most historians, it is regarded to have been the worst possible type of torture and killing that existed. One historian wrote it this way, when the criminal's arms were outstretched and fastened by nails to the cross, he had to support most of the weight of his body with his arms. The chest cavity would be pulled upward and outward, making it difficult to exhale meaning it was difficult to draw any fresh breath. When the victim's longing for oxygen became so unbearable that he had no other choice, he would push himself up by his feet, thus giving more natural support to the weight of his body, releasing some of the weight from his arms, and enabling his chest cavity to contract more normally. By pushing himself upward in this way, the criminal could fend off suffocation. But it was extremely painful because it required putting the body's weight on the nails holding the feet. It required him to bend the elbows and pull upward on the nails driven through his hands and wrists. The criminal's back, which would have been torn open by the floggings that they gave prior to crucifixion, would have scraped against the wooden cross with each breath. Thus Seneca in 1st century AD spoke of a crucified man drawing the breath of life amid long drawn out agony. He endured the suffering we deserved. We look at the cross and what happened there so abstractly at times. It always does us good to remember exactly what it costs for us. The suffering that would have been ours. 
Sometimes we look at the cost as some transaction. Substitutionary atonement tells us it was not a transaction. It was a substitution. Had He not done this for you, this is what you would have received. The crucifixion might be a horrible depiction of execution, but our judgment under a holy God without the cross of Christ would be much worse. We fear man because we do not fear God. And in that, it tells us we have lost at least a little bit of our virtue and our vision of exactly the suffering and the cause of Christ. Jesus saved us instead of Himself. They hollered and yelled at Him, if you are the Christ, come down off the cross. If you are truly the Son of God, why does God not save you? Because if He'd have saved Him, we would not be able to be saved. It's like a thing I read the other day that said why is Barabbas even brought up in the narrative of the cross and why do they even bring that segment in it's it's only highlighting of course maybe the the viciousness of the crowd and their commitment to the crucifixion of Christ but scripture doesn't usually put things in there just for one simple reason I think it's also very possible that Barabbas it's supposed to be us. The person who didn't deserve it. The first person set loose at the cost of Christ. And millions have been set loose because of the cost of Christ since then. And at any moment, He could have ended it. Come down from the cross and we would be lost. But He chose to save us instead of saving Himself. Romans 3.25 says, Whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in His divine forbearance He had passed over the former sins. Jesus paid a price that we could not. It is not just moral neutrality that we need from Christ. What I mean by that is we don't just need a clean slate. Christ doesn't give us a new beginning to get it right. He gives us so much more than that. He gives us a clean slate, a new start, but then also secures our salvation by giving us His righteousness because even with salvation, we would mess it up. We would find some way to do it wrong. He paid a price that we could not. It does not simply give us a good start. It gives us a firm footing. Russell Moore said something like this in his book Onward. says, both the village and the lawyer wanted to interview Jesus to see if he could grant them the life they wanted for themselves. But Jesus had some questions of his own. Jesus hadn't come to enter their lives. He came to wreck their lives and to invite them into His. And too often we are so caught up with the fact that God meets us where we are that we start thinking God accepts us the way we are. God does not accept us the way we are. God accepts us on the basis of the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ. He invites us into His life because if we tried to stand on our own merits, we would fall. Hell would be our destination and there would be no reward. Jesus defeated a death that we could not escape. Particularly on Christmas morning, we celebrate this fact that He is risen. He's alive. The doorpost and the lentil are now covered in a blood that cannot be washed away. It can't be faded or diminished in any way. 
In the story of the Passover, they had to slaughter a lamb and take the blood and put it on the doorpost in Lenore, their homes, and then the angel of death would cross past them and not visit death upon that house. And today we have something much stronger than that blood that secures our future and has paid our price. As believers, we are redeemed, secured, and kept by the blood of the atonement. Christ's death was enough. Ours is to trust. His was to deliver. And He will deliver. Ephesians 1.13 says, In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. If all we were able to do was come today and celebrate the fact that every time we ask for forgiveness, God gives us a fresh start, we would constantly be back into the same cycle as the nation of Israel offering countless amounts of sacrifices to try to assuage the judgment of God. But we don't have to do that anymore. We're sealed by the promise of the Holy Spirit and it's all because of the blood atonement, the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ. There's an old familiar hymn that puts it extremely well. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my pardon, this I see, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing, this my plea, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not of good that I have done. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. There, this is all my hope and peace. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Substitutionary atonement is what we celebrate today. Yes, we celebrate a risen Lord. We celebrate a Savior that is alive and well and working in our hearts and in our lives and our midst today. But don't forget the price. And don't forget that I made Him pay that price and you made Him pay that price. It was not his debt that was owed. But nothing but the blood of Jesus would atone for our sin. Do you know that flow? Have you been washed by that blood? If not, today is the day for you to experience the atonement that has been paid for you. I'll wrap this up with some words from another song that we'll be singing here soon at some point in our worship times the words are from the center portion of a song called yet not I no fate I dread I know I am forgiven the future sure the price has been paid for Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon and he was raised to overthrow the grave to this I hold my sin has been defeated Jesus, now and ever, is my plea. Oh, the chains are released and I can sing, I am free, yet not I, but Christ in me. Today is a day where we celebrate this substitutionary atonement, and today is a day for you to place your faith in the spotless Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, who takes away the sins of the world.